to start that over again. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is a special edition of Hands on Ideas. Um, today, we've got uh, Tom Keen with his project Uncertain Substance. Tom's joining us from the UK. It's September 4th, 2013. And um, Tom is a uh, um, is, is, is quite the interesting guy. He's a, he's a, a programmer who's moved into uh, doing art um, and especially uh, some media art that we're going to take a look at to use kind of the very algorithms that underlie a lot of our communications technology to reveal more about what we say in that technology. Uh, so we're really excited to have you, Tom. And uh, thanks for staying up a little bit late. Um, probably a, um, you're going to be uh, a little bit late for dinner, so we thank you for that. But um, the format for everybody that doesn't know, if you haven't joined us before, the the, uh, dis the uh, hands-on idea sessions are done by us at Openly Disruptive. And for these, we bring in somebody that's doing some really interesting work, and they're going to talk about their work. Um, they're going to talk about um, what, um, uh, what they're doing and how you can build on it and what inspired them. And so Tom has uh, put together a presentation. Uh, don't feel like you have to take notes, uh, you know, copious notes or anything, um, because um, his slides, uh, a video of this presentation, as well as any links that Tom refers to, will be posted on our site um, uh, within 24 hours. And um, so Tom, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, I'm gonna, about to pass over control to you, but. Um, would you say that would you add anything else before you got started about kind of how uh, what you're about and why I'm about and why oh that's a broad question um, I'm an artist and a, a technologist um, and I started to become increasingly frustrated um, with a lack of critical thinking about technology and really trying to understand what it's doing how it's operating on us and through us. And I feel like I'm just at the beginnings of um, finding a methodology and a way of like a, a way of doing slider. that. Not yet. Well, great. Well, I'm about to hand over control to you. Um, and I think if you could, I think that's a great starting point. So let's thought, you know, less thinking about technology for technology's sake and more thinking about the technology um, and our relationship with it and building some uh, critical thinking skills. So Tom, if you would just kind of walk people through, and I know that you've kind of set up to do this, but what kind of inspired you to go down this path? And then you're going to get into the specific project, um, you know, Uncertain Substance. And uh, I've been telling a lot of people about it um, based on a story that you and I chatted about uh, that came out in the news that um, a German architect was making copies of some drawings that he had made. Some, some blueprints and he you know take, took them to a large format copier at uh, wherever he was at and scanned them and um, and then when he got the copy out he being the very diligent architect that he was was looking at the figures to proofread it make sure there was no errors and he actually found a column of numbers where the values were different on the original from what had copied and of course we don't expect our copiers to change the content of what we do and so he looked into it a little bit, it turns out that there is an algorithm that does error correction on scanners. So if you had, you know, you wouldn't want a scanner that told you every time it, it misread a pixel. And so um, the scanner actually, um, when it has an error, it looks in its library of possible images for something else that will fit that gap and um, and, and it was smooth edges. And so what it did was when it saw maybe missing sixes or nines or whatever, it looked out and in Helvetica, hey, an eight also fits in there and that will fill that shape. And so it was actually changing the values. So the, uh, the lesson uh, that this particular person had was don't use Helvetica or Arial as fonts <laughs> because the copiers will too easily change them to some other values. Use a serif font that doesn't look the same in different orientations. But, um, you know, so there can be some very real world um, implications from not understanding, not having the critical thinking skills that you're talking about here, but you've got a much more thought provoking kind of story to tell us. So with that, I want to kind of turn it over to you and uh, let's, let's hear, let's hear your, uh, let's hear you speak. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, in 
response to that example, I thought I thought of another example as well um, of algorithms going wrong, um, which I think was quite well known at the time. When a, a book on flies being advertised on Amazon, um, which should have been selling for I think for five dollars or something like that, ended up being sold for a million dollars. Um, because these algorithms were increasing the price, they were indexed against each each other. So very sort of simple programmatic mistakes um, can start to create sort of way out of control situations. If we know from sort of current financial um, sort, of, um, sort of situation. Um, but the question right. is, did the merchant sell any? Uh, I don't <laughs> think so. And luckily for them, uh, so, if so I'm mean, certainly in the wrong business. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, well, that's one thing. I'm quite happy to be interrupted or for people to interrupt, go off on a tangent, or correct me, or ask for more detail. Um, I think it can sort of make a richer, uh, richer presentation. So feel free if people have got questions. Um, a little bit about me. Um, yeah, as I said before, I'm an artist who's I'm learning to critically engage with technology. Um, and that means asking questions about what it's doing, what it's doing to me, how it's operating on me, how it's making me change my actions, um, how it's operating through me, making me do stuff um, that isn't necessarily as a result of what I intended to do, but as a response to what that technology is setting up, what it's doing. Um, I originally Sort of started out or studied photography, so I had an arts background, um, but that was around the time of the dot com boom. Um, so I ended up getting sucked into the dot com industry and learnt about um, programming. And so I became a self taught programmer, and it was partly um, one of the reasons for that was um, I saw people doing really interesting things with computers that knew how to program, and I really wanted to be able to do that. So I used the industry as a way of um, learning that, um, and slowly um, sort of tried to extract myself out of industry over the years um, and gone back into the um, arts world now. Um, and the kinds of projects I've been working on, I suppose, over the last um, ten years or so, um, have been extremely varied. Um, I've often worked in a participatory or community arts um, context, so not for white cube gallery spaces, working with lo local communities, um, working with older people, younger people, um, people from lots and lots of different backgrounds. Um, I've worked uh, with an artist called Anna Dimitriou, um, where we worked and examined bacterial communication systems. So we're comparing how bacteria communicate um, to the way that um, internet packets or systems work. And believe it or not, bacteria um, has sends a little electrical pulses and messages to each other. Um, I've worked with face recognition technologies. Um, I've worked on sign painting projects, so a real mixture, um, a mixture of stuff. Um, but a thread sort of through it all, I suppose, is looking at ways that people sort of communicate and sort of disrupting the way that people communicate. Um, as I've mentioned, I'm a self-taught programmer, um, and I've always been a maker, making things out of wood, metal, electronics. Um, in fact, me and my sister used to program on the BBC B when we were little, taking it in turns to copy games out of magazines. Um, so I've kind of always been very, very closely aligned with um, technology and been very interested in it. So, um, so Tom, last what, year, what, what is the BBC B? Um, the BBC B computer, very ah. early um, computer that were um, distributed around UK schools. Uh, is it the 1980s? Um, so it's kind of what the Raspberry Pi um, is trying to repeat, because um, the BBC B, uh, you started using it and you kind of had to program with it. Mm. So it taught you about computers. Oh, gotcha. Um, and, yeah. So, um, so you couldn't just go straight to Angry Birds, you had to program. You couldn't go straight to Angry Birds, you had to write Angry Birds. Um, <laughs> so there were lots of... <laughs> um, so the little snake program you get on, you know, on mobile phones, um, sort of earlier mobile phones, um, that was one of the programs that me and my sister sort of copied out. Um, gotcha. And, yeah, and that was something because my yeah my mum ended up having one, um, having yeah buying a BBCB at home, so we used it when we were kids. 
Um, but then I had a very big gap between sort of using a computer and I didn't properly start using a computer again until I started university when computers were introduced onto the photography course that I was on. And so that's when my interest really started firing up again. Um, in last year I completed an MA in Interactive Media Critical Theory and Practice um, at Goldsmiths University in London. Um, and as I mentioned before, I had a real desire um, to do something more interesting with technology rather than just make pretty things. Um, I'd, I mean, maybe it was perhaps tied into a bit of jealousy with these amazing programmers that can create these very beautiful um, kind of things, visualizations, um, and very, very clever sort of programmatic setups. Um, and I thought, mm, well, I'm never going to be as good a programmer as that. I need to have a different feather in my cap. <laughs> So, uh, this course really started to illuminate a different way of thinking about technology that I sort of found much, much more satisfying, much more, um, give, yeah, it's given me a much deeper understanding of technology rather than just trying to follow the latest curve of whatever the latest programming fad is or whatever um, the sort of new flashiest, whizziest thing is that everybody gets excited about because it's, that world is very, very seductive. Um, and so I suppose I wanted to slow down, and that's what that MA made, enabled me to do, it enabled me to slow down and start to look um, at the technologies that have become invisible and have creeped up on us um, very, yeah, over a long period of time. These things didn't suddenly appear in the 1960s or 50s or 40s. They've been a very, very long time coming. Um, in terms of inspiration on this current project, on Uncertain Substance, um, I think there's one book in particular, um, Wirelessness, Radical Empiricism in Network Cultures by Adrian McKenzie that has had a huge effect on my work. Um, it's really enabled me to look at technological objects in a different way. And when I say technological objects, uh, I mean things like mobile phones, a computer, a microchip. Um, and of course, wirelessness, the title of the uh, wireless technology is the title of the book. And what Adrian does um, is provide a means to think about wireless technologies, not as um, single um, technological objects, not just as a mobile phone and looking just at the mobile phone, but a whole broad spectrum of what wireless technologies constitute. Um, and it constitutes the advertising around it. So when you see a little Wi-Fi signal, that's part of wirelessness. You know you're entering a wireless area, a wireless location. There's a there's a, a NUS, there's a wireless NUS. Um, you mobile phones, of course, are part of it. Um, believe it or not, uh, sewage networks are part of wireless technologies because, particularly in London, a lot of fibre optic networks are being laid in sewage networks and that's how capacity and bandwidth is being extended so rapidly to masts and antennas that are being put in cities. Um, Tom, so are, you, uh, are you familiar his writing with, is about... Are you, are you familiar with the grinder movement of these people that are actually implanting sensors in themselves? Um, yes. And there are actually people that have actually put RF, uh, RF Wi-Fi uh, sensors under their skin so that they, because they're trying to actually be able to touch the your your field of, of Wi-Fi um, yeah. and, and, and turn it into a tactile sensation. Kind of crazy stuff. Yeah. That's uh, what's the name of the performance artist who implanted an ear on his arm? And, right. That's um, the same thing, but he's the, I believe he's the same person that did this with a with an RF detector because um, yeah you know, they, they started doing it with, with small magnets and now they've moved to detectors and they yeah so that you can actually get a tactile sense of an RF field, for example. Yeah, and the, um, uh, the implanting of magnets under skin has now become a sort of pop culture thing that's part of um, tattoo um, right. um, sort of culture. It's sort of um, you know, body augmentation and all of that. So, so yeah, um, you're right. Wirelessness isn't just the phone. I mean, even if we just considered the whole back end of the network, which is much more substantial mm -hmm. than our part of it, you know, you know, the consumer end of the phone, 
the connection or whatever is actually fairly a fairly small part of everything that's going on and all the players and stakeholders. Yeah, and it sort of goes it goes beyond that as well. It's there can be no wireless technologies around you. You could be a million miles away from anywhere, um, yet you can still have sensations and feelings that are attached to wirelessness. You know the little the I don't know if you get it, but I certainly get it. A feeling that my mobile phone has buzzed in my pocket. Um, but in fact, it hasn't. It's my leg that's twinged and giving me that sensation. Um, the the sense that you know that you can be located through echolocation, through you know all of these other technologies, it sort of fundamentally starts to change the way you move about the world because you know you're not that far from some kind of connection. Um, and you know the fact that TV transmissions are going out into space at night, and you know. Um, so we're surrounded by all of these things. So it's, yeah, Adrian McKenzie's wirelessness really started to broaden my mind about how to understand these kinds of technologies. Um, I've listed here also the Open Systems Association. Um, that's a group of us who all gone through this MA in interactive media at Goldsmiths, um, which is um, uh, run by Graham Harwood, who's the lab director, and Luciana Parisi, who's a theorist. Um, the Open Systems Association is a group of um, theorists, artists, makers, thinkers, writers um, who've all been through that course and some people that haven't, um, who are keeping the conversation going. So we're having exhibitions and we're collaborating on projects and supporting each other because I think it's um, when you do an MA, it's very easy to start forgetting about the stuff that you're engaging with. So the Open Systems Association has been really key in terms of keeping a lot of these thoughts alive and really reflecting them back at me. Um, the, I mentioned Graham Harwood there. Um, his artists, uh, or his and Matsuko's um, artist collective, uh, Yoha, um, has been incredibly influential. Um, Again, I mean, because Graham ran the course that I'm on, and I've subsequently been collaborating with him on projects. Um, he, if I could describe Graham, um, he's very socially minded and is not so interested about the technology for technology's sake, but really making you think about what it's doing and really providing tools that have enabled me to unfold technologies and learn how to look at, say, a mobile phone or a speech recognition system and start to get um, sort of under the skin of what it might be doing. Um, and finally, uh, there's a book called Evil Media by Matthew Fuller and Andrew Goffey. Um, and in some respects, that kind of provides the framework for the body of work that I'm now engaged with. Um, Evil media starts to introduce a different way of um, thinking about media and what media is and extending it beyond um, uh, thinking about just a, a video or a magazine or a radio show um, and extending, yeah, just extending the um, notion of it. Um, and, and is the evil thinking about media? It, it, is the evilness, you know, the, the idea that because there's all these players at work and everything, that the, the media isn't just this passive thing, that the ether that things move through, but that it takes on some characteristics of its own. It, it, it ends up having some agency in the, in the whole dialogue. Exactly. Yeah, you just, you've, you've found the words I was just looking for then. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the thinking behind it is that Technological objects have an agency. They have, um, they coerce you into doing things. They have a particular thing that they want to do. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about, you know, it's not about human intelligence, but they have an inbuilt intelligence. A chair has an inbuilt intelligence in that when you sit on it, it structures your body in a particular way. You bend to fit it. Yes, we've designed it, but that technological object now has its own. Um, it, now has its own agenda or direction, it, it, it has its own pressure, it has its own powers of coercion. Um, pointy legs will mean it will sink into the ground, um, or flatter legs will mean it can be on other, yeah, it, it, 
of these objects have their own sort of agency. Um, a project that I worked on um, in response to Evil Media was a project instigated by Yoha, which I'll just flip us to, um, which is the Evil Media Distribution Center. Um, and this was a response to, the, to Matthew's Evil Media book, where Yoha invited um, over 60 different people to contribute a text about a technological object. Um, and to write about it in a humorous way, um, in quite a dull um, way. So it's about choosing the dull everyday objects rather than um, thinking about the newest exciting kinds of things. Um, and getting people yeah, to write about these objects and think, you know, how are they evil? How are they um, sort of structuring and conditioning the social world that we're in? Um, so an example I particularly like is the ISO shipping container corner, um, where the corners of shipping containers um, have structured a whole international shipping and goods industry. Um, there's some very, very long, boring videos online you can find out about the ISO shipping container corner, including all um, specifications for how big it is, the curvature, all of these kinds of things. And without that kind of specification, um, the global shipping industry wouldn't work. It would, it would fall apart. Um, and we know how global shipping is affecting the planet. <laughs> um, so these very inconsequential small objects you know, can have a very long-reaching and not necessarily predictable um, effect. And, and, and so like in, and like in this in, in that story, you know, and you told me this before when we talked uh, originally that you know th it also gets into it used to cost six dollars a ton to unload this cargo mm -hmm. because of all of the longshoremen that were employed in it, and now it costs pennies a ton, and there's very few longshoremen. So it meant, you know, the one of the evil aspects of it it was a trade-off. Do we want our cheap goods? Do we want a, a you know a very efficient trade network, or do we want to have a lot of people? you know, handling, you know, touching that cargo over and over again. So, so it's not yeah. just a neutral thing. Exactly. Um, and I think the, the sort of key point I want to put across is that um, we don't know the effects that, you know, what kind of new connections are going to be made by these um, technologies. Um, there's kind of, there's a conversation going on between these technologies in terms of how they interact between all of these different global networks, physical objects. Um, there's all this conversation going on between all of these objects that we're not party to and we won't ever know, we won't ever understand. We just see the effects in terms of how it's changing the environment, um, how we're responding to those changes and what we do as a response to it. Um, so this is thinking that's getting away from um, thinking about there's these global capitalist players that are in control of everything and thinking actually the structures and systems that are there they're the things that are perhaps controlling what we're doing. And that's not about letting um, sort of evil, evil global organizations um, off the hook, because they've certainly contributed a hell of a lot. But it's, it's saying perhaps these evil global organizations are as trapped in these systems that we are. It, it's constructed them. It's made them sort of happen. So we need to think about um, how we start to change and implement those sort of underlying structures to combat this in a way. So I think it might start to invite a different way of thinking about capitalism and ways of mitigating some of the negative effects of it. Um, let me just flip back to the presentation. There we go. Um, so that, I think, gives you quite a good grounding of, um, yeah, what my inspiration is and where my head's at, um, head's at, at the moment. Um, so with this Vitaby project, um, as I've been looking at a lot at um, wireless technologies, um, and in Adrian's book, I'd stumbled across the Vitaby algorithm, um, and it seemed a suitably difficult thing to start to examine, because um, an algorithm is a very abstract concept. Um, so I kind of had this thinking in my head that, OK, these technological objects, of which an algorithm is a technological object, changes the world in which we live. And so this is part of my investigation, is how is an algorithm able to construct the world that we live in? And 
why isn't it just somebody that's programmed something and they've made it happen? What is it about the algorithm itself? Um, my second question is, how does it operate outside of any design intent? Um, what happens by mistake? Um, what's um, yeah, what sorts of new social relations does it start to construct? What sort of possibilities does it start to invite? Um, and this all ties into um, developing a different concept of control, which I touched on, um, where it's sort of getting beyond you, getting beyond sort of evil, single evil capitalist people that are in control. That it's these structures and systems and individual kind of objects that create this incredibly complex sort of system and sets of effect. Um, that's perhaps where a lot of the control lies. So we're kind of being pushed around in an eddy of water and hardly in control of anything. Um, and the final thing I wanted to explore was an open-ended process-led methodology that enabled me to make mistakes. Very often, um, you approach your programming, or I approach a programming task, and it's about making things precise and it doing a very specific um, job. Um, it's and you end up being, or I end up being, very technology led. I immediately go into building technology or creating something very complex, um, and I didn't want to enter this project um, with any clear idea of what an end outcome would be. I wanted to leave things as open as possible. Um, and make as many mistakes as possible and observe what those mistakes are and why I was making those mistakes. Um, it's, I don't know how successful I've been in trying to answer those questions, but that's what I've been um, exploring. Um, so to go on to the project itself, um, I mean, this, this is the end point, really, or one of the end points, um, and that I ended up creating a system that searches radio waves looking for conversations about money. Um, and I did that by firstly exploring the history of the algorithm, uh, trying to find out as much as I could about it, just looking online, seeing, um, looking at the history of Andrew Vitterby when he invented it. Um, I attempted to understand the mathematics. I underlined so, uh, attempted. Actually, if I could Tom, I, I just wanted to interject, and I don't know if you're going to cover this, but I think it's kind of interesting that the Vitterby algorithm, you know, and, and I, I think you're going to touch on exactly how it gets used in a network and everything, but um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that Vitterby was uh, an engineer, and in fact, uh, I believe the School of Engineering at University of Southern California is named after him. Um, he, he's an electrical engineer, and he um, ended up being one of the co-founders of Qualcomm. So... Um, you know, the Vitterby alg algorithm actually was done by one of these people very fundamental to the forming of this uh, wireless network that we're all part of, you know, because of the standards and everything that emerged out of Qualcomm. So this isn't just some, you know, thing that happened in a journal one time in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and you told an interesting story that he actually didn't... Um, you know, you would think, oh, so this is probably this, you know, this very expensive thing to license or whatever. And he actually didn't think there was a way to license it. So he just kind of let anybody use it that wanted to. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, he didn't see a point in licensing it. Well, as far as I know, I um, didn't see a point in licensing it or trying to close it down at all. Didn't perhaps see a worth um, of doing it. Um, would see it sort of creating more hassle than, um, yeah, than it would be worth. Um, so yeah, I explored the history of the algorithm, attempted to understand the mathematics, and mathematics is certainly not my strong point. Um, but because I've been programming for a long while, I kind of thought I'd be able to understand it. I'd be able to see a neat little algorithm written that I could read and sort of unpack and understand what it was doing. So that was what I hoped. <laughs> um, and then I started to build contraptions and devices as a means to reveal how it operates. So created primitive transmitters, software defined radio, speech recognition systems. Um, I even ended up doing an experiment with a Roomba vacuum cleaner, an automatic um, vacuum cleaner, um, taking it to a shopping center and setting it off on its way, seeing it, how it found its path. Um, so I performed lots and lots and lots of these small experiments to try and 
get closer to um, sort of understanding what it was doing and try lots of different ways of understanding um, yeah, the structure of this algorithm because um, as I said I found the mathematics very difficult and impossible to read um, so I needed to find other inroads, other ways of approaching this. Um, that picture on the right, by the way, as you may have guessed, is uh, one of the experiments, one of the mobile experiments that I implemented. <laughs> so I'll be getting onto that a bit later. Um, this was the first diagram that I put together um, where I just started to pull together all of the different bits and pieces that I was finding um, out about the Viterbi. Um, that um, it was invented by Andrew Viterbi in 1967. Um, he worked, had been working with guided missile systems, um, founded Qualcomm, um, Linkabit, uh, used in video scrambling, um, called Video Cipher. Um, in fact, that was its main use. It was used for distributing sort of wireless, um, wireless on-demand video. Um, it's got used in satellite communication systems, um, video devices, mobile devices, wireless technologies, uh, standards and protocols started to be configured around it. Um, cell phones obviously use it, so you've got infrastructure of masts, networks, routers, all of these kinds of things start to be introduced um, partly as a result of the Viterbi, you know. And I think the thing to remember is you've got the Viterbi here, which seems to have all of this effect, but all of these other things are almost, they're on the same level as well. They're affecting the Viterbi, the Viterbi's affecting it. There's kind of this maelstrom of all of these different things going on. Um, you have dedicated integrated circuits. Um, which are hardware representations of this algorithm. Um, so an algorithm, yeah, it's a mathematical concept. Um, we think of mathematical notation, but you can also have a physical representation, so sort of switches, which is that mathematical entity. Um, it's, yeah, signal processing and encoding. Um, I stumbled across uh, a story about the actress Hedy Lamarr and composer George Antile in um, God, which date was that? I think it was 1940s or something. And they developed um, spread spectrum technology, and it's all of those kinds of things, spread spectrum technology, which gave a rise to sort of the Viterbi algorithm, the new and sort of neater ways of being able to um, encode and decipher signals through noisy realms. Um, the Viterbi has been used um, in DNA analysis, speech recognition technologies, artificial intelligence. Um, so it's embedded in a lot of places. And I, creating this diagram, I very quickly realized the futility of creating this kind of diagram. It's all very neat and looks like there's very clear linear connections between things. Um, but the reality is, is more like this. There's things mixing all over. Um, I generated this diagram just using an auto diagram function um, on the software I happened to be using at the time. The software which created this slide, I got it to create this slide just by clicking a button. So using a um, computational structure, uh, sort of an automated system, sort of restructures information, and it seemed more appropriate visually and graphically to what the Viterbi is and a lot of these technological objects. Um, because so Tom, what talk? Yeah. Can you just briefly touch on why you called this Viterbi entanglement at this point? Why, why did you use that term? Um, because it seems the more you, I read about it, the more it seemed to be entangled in so many of our communications technologies. Um, it, it seemed to be absolutely everywhere. As I said, it's in satellite communication systems. It's used to read data off of hard disks. Um, it's used in DNA analysis, um, in encoding, decoding mobile phone signals. Um, it's yeah, it just seemed to be entangled in so many different um, technologies. You know, it was, it was like this sort of seemingly dull, boring, tiny little algorithm 
um, seem to be behind so much of contemporary communications technologies um, and was inviting ways of looking at coded systems, um, which is where it's going now, and coded systems such as DNA. Um, it's, I've read about it recently being used um, in gunshot recognition systems. So in cities, um, you have sensors set up. I think New York perhaps has got a load of them installed. Detroit certainly has. Um, so gunshot recognition systems that automatically detect gunshots and let local police forces know about it. So, um, so, so, so it's, it's really it's really an algorithm that then kind of lets you separate the signal from the noise, or at least start to start doing that. Is it, it, would that be a fair simplification of it? Exactly. Um, yeah, that's exactly what it's doing. And I'm, I'm sort of going to move on um, and have an attempt at explaining what it's doing in my own way. <laughs> so I hope people um, people follow it. Um, so. This was the mathematical paper, Andrew's, Andrew Vitterby's original mathematical paper that he wrote. Um, and when I saw this paper, that's when I realized, my God, I'm not really going to be able to understand this, um, you, looking at mathematical notation. So in mathematical speak, um, the probability of error in decoding an optimal convolution code transmitted over memoryless channel is bounded from above and below as a function of the constraint length of the code. For all but pathological channels, the bounds are asymptotically um, exponentially tight for rates above R, brackets zero, the computational cutoff rate of sequential decoding. Um, you get the idea. Uh, there was no way I was going to be able to understand this. I, I started investigating mathematical notation and the history of mathematical notation and fonts used and the formative nature of it and thought this is going to be a dead end for me to really sort of understand um, what's going on with it. Um, so I started to read sort of layman's descriptions of what's going on, and what the Viterbi does is, it no if it knows how a signal has been encoded, so it knows the structure of it, then it knows what it needs to look for to decode it. So in wireless signals, um, something called convolutional encoding is used. So if you have a message. Oh, let me go back. A message, which is called example, um, and you have a shift register. So shift register um, is a very early computer component, component, um, and it's a mathematical concept. Um, in fact, I've seen the one of the first shift registers um, in the Colossus computer at the Museum of Computing um, in the UK. Um, and what it does is it stores a state. So this initial starting state of the shift register is 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, and what a shift register does is you put an item on the end and it drops an item off the other end. You put, it, sorry, you put an item at the start and it drops an item off the end. So if we want to encode the word example um, using a convolutional encoding system, we'd add E to the beginning of the shift register. And then we've got E000. We add X, and so it moves everything along one. So you've got the E, uh, which is moved along, which is that E, and 00, zero and then zero is dropped off the end. And then on and on and on until the whole message is encoded. So what you've got now is the message along with a lot of redundant data. Um, so it's extra data that's in there. So if some goes missing, because the Viterbi knows the structure, it knows what to expect, um, it can decipher what's going on. Um, so what the Viterbi does, it creates a survivor path. So it looks at the received data. And remember, there was, in wireless systems, it's received data as zeros and ones. Um, and those zeros and ones might be coming from multiple mobile phones, from laptops, from all over the place, from 3G networks, um, and it has to decipher what those zeros and ones are, those voltage differentials. Um, and because it knows a particular grammar, so in our example, it knows it, it needs to accept four bits of information, um, and in those four bits, any four bits of information, it's got a history of what's gone previously in it. 
Um, so it's kind of, it's sort of, Adrian McKenzie describes it in terms of it's, it's folding time, it's folding, um, it's folding and wrapping things around itself. So any part of the message has got a memory of what's gone previously. Right, and so, this becomes critical in digital, uh, if I'm right, because like in analog, if you drop a little bit, that's just static. You get noise or you get an absence of signal. But in digital, that bit, that one or zero the, or that letter or whatever, could be sending all kinds of things that are, are messages about what the entire system should do and how the system re should respond, not just exactly. that that's missing content. That could be missing system information. Exactly, yeah. Right, so, and that's that's what the Viterbi provides. It provides a very, very robust way of ensuring you've got the whole signal because um, it knows to look for a start point and an end point in a signal. Um, and so, and it knows how long it ought to be. So it knows whatever data it's receiving because it doesn't know the data ahead of time. Whatever data it's receiving, it should be in a particular structure. And that structure becomes apparent the more data that you see. Um, and so it works out what the most likely path is through, you know, using a tree, a probability tree, exactly like this. Um, so it works out what's the most likely bit of information that it ought to be seeing next. Um, and, I mean, the analog example um, is it's like talking across a noisy room. So if you've got lots of people talking in a room, um, because we know the grammar of conversation, we can decipher what is said without hearing every word or letter. We know how the English language or whatever language is construct how, how it's constructed. So we don't have to hear everything. Um, we've got inbuilt redundancy in the way that we talk. Um, so the Viterbi is searching yeah, for a particular structure of data and is able to take a guess based on the current available information. So that's really key. It's always in the present. Um, it's saying, okay, this is the current data, this is how I'm going to make sense of it, and this is the path that I need to take through it. Um, so my brain started to hurt after spending such a long time trying to understand all of the mathematics. Um, so I did a bit of um, research into early wireless, um, people experimenting with early wireless systems, and came across a guy called Harry Grindle Matthews. Um, and oh, it was a great fact that he patented the first, uh, world's first mobile phone in 1909. So mobile phones didn't appear in the 80s, 70s, 60s, whatever. Um, the concept of them, the desire for them, the thought of them um, was already there. Um, people had been thinking about these things for a long while. People had been thinking about communication over distance for a very, very long time. So um, was, he, was he a contemporary of Tesla, what the work Tesla was trying to do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, he's, should I forget the dates of Tesla? I think he might even be a little bit earlier, possibly, but don't, don't quote me on that. Um, he, um, I mean, he's, he wasn't he wasn't a successful, or what we think of as a successful inventor. Um, you know, his name wasn't held up in lights, um, but he, he experimented with huge numbers of technologies, like remote control submarine systems, and um, yeah, wireless, different, lots of different types of wireless communication systems. Um, and he, as the name of this book says, um, he invented a death ray in 1924, which he possibly sold to the French, so it's very murky um, whether that actually occurred or not. Um, so he was kind of, yeah, he was very much on the fringes of um, science and sort of the establishment would he'd sometimes be in favour and quite often would not be. Um, so he didn't very, make very much money out of what he was doing. Um, but he, um, yeah, was a voracious experimenter. Um, and it was through looking at his work that I found out about spark gap transmitters, which are very early forms of um, radio communication. In fact, they're the communication device that we used on the Titanic. Um, and I thought, just purely as an experiment, to try and get to the nuts and bolts of you know what wireless communication is, what's it, what's it, at its very sort of base level, what is it? Um, 
remembering, of course, that wireless communication uh, started at the Big Bang because radio waves <laughs> started to be sent at that point. Um, so interstellar bodies communicating, if you want to go that far. Um, I built a spark gap transmitter. Um, and in fact, you've got a spark gap transmitter in every single car. Um, so every car is broadcasting a wireless signal. Um, we, yeah, we, so when cars drive by, they can interrupt um, radio those and things. And so I took apart from a car um, and constructed a spark gap transmitter, um, partly because it's a fun thing to do, and I'm saying more to get at sort of nuts and bolts of what this wireless stuff was about. Um, and it took me a long time to get it working, and when I finally did get it working, the TV happened to be on in the background, and it caused the TV signal to disrupt. Um, this isn't a screenshot from that TV disrupting, it's an approximation. Um, but wireless signals, as I was sort of understanding more and more, um, it's all about interference, trying to avoid interference. Um, and I started to stumble across, I had a bit of a eureka moment of, okay, this is, this is an indication of where the Viterbi algorithm is starting to fail. Um, where signals break down, where we start to experience signals breaking down, that's the point at which the Viterbi algorithm is unable to get data or information. Um, and we start to experience the way that it fails in lots of different ways, such as images um, not displaying correctly, hard drives not reading um, correctly. And as that occurs, we start to change how those kinds of devices um, are designed and built. Um, whenever we see a a uh, mobile phone signal go down on our um, on our mobile phone. The little bars, that's the bit of the algorithm sort of struggling to work. Um, the next thing I experimented with was a, a software-defined radio. Um, I read about on Hack the website Hackaday, um, how somebody discovered that a 10 pounds USB TV tuner system could be hacked to turn into a software-defined radio system. Um, these systems usually cost about a thousand pounds or more, and this guy worked out how he could hack into them, um, get, the raw, um, get the raw signal data, um, and use software um, to interpret it. So you could use software to decode an FM radio signal, an AM radio signal. Um, and so I decided to, I thought, okay, this has started to be in the realms of Viterbi kind of stuff, so I built one of those. And there's instructions here on, on a way of building it. Um, it's, I think the instructions specify the Raspberry Pi, but it can be built on any Linux system. Um, I then dis discovered a bit of software called GQRX, um, which is a front end for GNU Radio, the software defined radio system. Um, so that enables you to visualize and see um, the radio frequencies and see what um, kilohertz you're tuned into. So again, this was me just playing around with different technologies and um, trying to get a different sense and look at sort of wirelessness in a different way. Um, and then I stumbled across, because um, I knew the Viterbi was utilised in speech recognition systems, and so I decided to look at open source speech recognition systems, searched the um, source code and discovered that the Viterbi used was used in um, CMU Sphinx, this open source toolkit for speech recognition. Um, and, and so it seemed perfect. I, I had a lot of these different experiments that I could bring together um, for this project. Um, I discovered when I initially tested it um, in a room full of people with lots of different accents that the words money was the one that it understood best. So this was purely by accident. Um, it would really struggle um, understanding or interpreting what people were saying, but as soon as the word money was said, it seemed to do, do it a lot better. But as you can see through here, this is it actually listening to radio stations. Um, it comes up, as it is at the moment, with really quite abstract stuff, and then every now and then it finds a voice that it likes and it does it word for word. Absolutely perfect. Um, and the bit of code that I used for this voice recognition system is up on my website, 
um, here, and that's a bit of Python code that I've just built off of somebody else much cleverer than me, um, and that I've hacked into and just added my own bits to. Um, and so this is me, my first experiment here um, of pulling together these different things. Um, so I've got a command line output here um, where I tried to print out what it was doing at any particular point in time. So you can see the under, or try and reveal the underlying mechanics. So you're, you're not just seeing text which was being generated live and you could see it working out where it's highlighted in blue while it was trying to work out what we might be said that blue area was changing very rapidly. Um, so I want to try and re reveal the underlying program and its process as much as possible um, rather than having swish interfaces that sort of hide everything. Um, and this was the first installation that I made. So the speech recognition server was here on a very dull grey computer um, and the radio server was here. Um, it was a speaker because you need a speaker if you need audio output. You need an antenna um, in order to receive the radio signal. Um, had a little receipt printer so if it found a conversation about money so this speech recognition system would listen to the radio stations that this tuned into. Um, if it found a conversation about money it would print it out here. Um, if it didn't, the system would get bored and it would tell this server to find another radio station and move on. So it just chugged away and moved through finding different um, conversations. Um, and I, this installation was in an old janitor's office um, in New Cross in London. Um, and I dressed the whole room. It was quite a depressing room. It had a tale of um, people becoming unemployed, lots of betting slips there and dress this whole room so everything would reflect the kinds of things that I've discovered about the Viterbi algorithm. So notes um, about computation, the mathematics, about its predictive qualities. Um, I also happened to find a CCTV um, screen um, which I created another quick little server that would output and speak found money every time the system found something. So you had this observation system there that was part of this room, part of the sort of very human environment. Um, and this, ah, yeah, this was a different installation I did uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I met a Brazilian guy who said that they use um, washing up scouring, sort of metal washing up scouring things to improve um, uh, radio reception. Um, so I thought I'd add that to the system. Quite, and the exhibition happened to be called Everything But the Kitchen, which was examination of technology. Um, I liked the fact that I had a kitchen relation to the Viterbi algorithm. And it, and, it, and it makes it look like a Muppet. It, <laughs> well, it gives it that cute edge, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how could it be so bad? It's all fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> so, generally what I discovered, um, this algorithm reconfigures cities. Um, you install transmitters, antennas, receivers. Um, it reorganizes people, how we communicate, how we do our work, where we do our work. Um, it, exerting power over distance. So um, because we can communicate at distance, um, we can now exert power over distant lands, distant people um, in much more subtle and precise ways. Um, it governs how and where information is consumed. So mobile phones, where and how we look at information is, it can't happen without the Viterbi and associated sort of technologies. Um, and the thing that I think I'm starting to look at and think about now is it attempts to apply a grammar to our interactions. It needs a mathematical model to understand something. So I mentioned gunshot earlier. It needs to understand what a gunshot might be. Um, could it be used in other ways? I mean, IBM's got its city management systems. Um, will it be used in those sorts of environments where it starts to apply grammar to human behaviour um, to see how things might play out? Would, did you have you considered that um, you, you know your earlier work with the uh, with the bacteria? You know, could you use this as a way to kind of create an interface? to, you know, if bacteria communicate with each other through pulses, could there be a, a grammar of a language for communicating with bacteria? Um, 
quite possibly. Um, speak to Simon Park, the bacteriologist, about that. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, quite possibly. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know the extent to which they worked out um, how bacteria are actually communicating. I think it might be at the point of knowing that they do communicate, but not how, not the structures. But you never know. There might be these sort of systems here. And like with DNA, you know, you've got a few simple letters, a particular yeah. structure. Um, there might be that kind of sort of simple underlying structure with bacteria. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to understand um, how they conjugate verbs or something. You're going <laughs> to... <laughs> well, they, they exhibit very, very complex behaviours. They tell each, you know, fight or flight responses. Um, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, um, they perform very sort of complex sort of structures um, based on very simple sets of rules and can communicate really quite large distances, um, potentially through the earth, because um, bacteria strains go across huge distances. Um, and when I say through the earth, I mean sort of cross-continental. Um, oh, yeah. um, so for further experimentation, I've been playing around with miniaturizing what I've been doing. So as soon as you miniaturize a setup, um, you can take into lots of different contexts. So my the setup, setup I have been using is two quite large computers and screens. So I've been playing around with Raspberry Pis and uh, mobile phone speech recognition systems and seeing what can I get out of them. Um, I want to think more about the social output. So could I create this money searching system that buys shares or sets a price on a commodity or something like that? And that's one thing I don't feel completely satisfied with. I want to uh, think about what kinds of social output it could have. Um, and just generally exploring other uses of the Vitibi. Um, this so, picture in the background, by the way. Yeah, go go, um, so by that social output, do you mean, you know, kind of using it to, you know, do some programmatic training, trading, but maybe based more on social things, like so the Occupy movement for every person that shows up in the plaza, something happens with a share someplace or something like that? Something like that, or having, I suppose with these technologies, they can be very separate from people. I want to create circumstances where it integrates with people much more so than I've been doing, because it's, it's a screen-based work. You, you go along and you look at it and it's very removed. And I'm just sort of thinking, is there a way of making it um, interact or change what people do in a particular way? Um, and I'm not quite, that's something I need to sort of mull over and think about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so you're, you know, you have some ability to use it to predict what should come or what's expected next. And then, yep. you know, do you have some way to then, you know, when somebody confounds that expectation, something happens, or when they fall in line with that expectation, something happens. That kind of thing. yeah, exactly. Interesting. Um, are, yeah, are there online networks that I can uh, sort of interrupt, disrupt, or play with, um, mm -hmm. sort of utilize this kind of system, um, and what kind of effect would occur? Because I think by taking these technologies into sort of unfamiliar realms, it starts to illuminate what they're doing much more, and using technologies that I don't know, instead of immediately going to the same old stuff that I do know, means I understand a bit more about it each time. Right. Do you... Um, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me get through right. this. Um, so, yeah, finally, um, how people can build on my work. I mean, there's the technological. So the speech recognition is terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I don't particularly mind that. It's a sort of amusing artifact. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but part of me, perhaps it's the engineer in me, does hanker after it being a, um, a sort of better working system. Um, I think it's, it would start to allow more sort of potential to happen. Um, and I've been amazed at the quality of the speech, re speech recognition with um, Google's speech recognition system. Um, though that's tied into Google and it's used to have an online connection and things like that. So, and I, recently, um, last night I was reading about improvements to the CMU Sphinx system, so that would be good to play around with. Um, tuning into TV, um, I think, would be a good realm because that starts to open up lots of different sort of uh, recognition possibilities. Um, and as I mentioned, installing on small devices. Um, and theoretically, people building off my work, I think it's a call to investigate the sort of dull and boring, the sort of instead of these exciting technologies, it's 
these underlying algorithms that are kind of there, this sort of the everyday stuff that kind of gets forgotten about, the administrative systems, um, rather than thinking about the latest whiz bang technologies, thinking about the boring everyday. Um, and it's thinking about technological objects never as a singular, but as complex assemblages of lots and lots of different kinds of things. They've got their own internal sort of conversations going on. A mobile phone has got thousands of technological objects within it. Um, and, and it's by looking at, I think, at the detail that you really start to understand what's going on. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's it. I've gone a bit over time. Yeah.